Um, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Um, if you need notes, raise your hand and I'll have a couple of the guys jump up and give you notes. If you need them, Brother Jim, if you can help him out with that, and Brother Glenn, that'd be sweet. If you need notes, get your hands up and the ushers will get those to you. So, they're working on it. Brother Jim, Brother Bob, can you help those that need notes get them? That'd be awesome. So, if you guys keep your hands up for them, they'll make sure they get them from you. The notes are on that back table by the box. Um, Ephesians chapter 6 is where we're going to start this evening. Uh, we'll open a word of prayer and then we'll jump right into it. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given to us and the opportunity we have to be to church this evening. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Be those that are feeling well, that they get well. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we continue our uh, discipleship lesson, lesson 13, um, it's living in light of eternity. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. It says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So, um, the daily battle rages. Um, when you live in light of eternity, you realize that there's a battle that's happening. And it's not a battle that we war with our flesh with someone else. It's a spiritual battle that happens. Now, it might happen in our flesh, um, but it is a spiritual battle that we can't see, which Ephesians kind of teaches us, and we'll kind of cover a little bit later in the lesson as well. Um, with a battle, you have to kind of know who you're warring against. Um, Satan is at war against God. Um, Satan's not necessarily against, I mean, he's against us if we're serving him, um, but Satan's number one enemy is not us. Satan's number one enemy is uh, the Lord. Um, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 20, or yeah, Ezekiel, sorry, Ezekiel chapter 20, um, and look at verse 12. I know you have it in your notes, but it's always good to just turn in your Bible to familiarize your side with it, um, and just the turning of God's word, the pages is a good sound. Um, so Ecclesi or Ezekiel, sorry, 28, uh, verses 12 through 15. It says, The Son of Man take up a lamentation uh, upon the king of Tarsus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Uh, every precious stone was thy covering, this, uh, the sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, and the barrel, the onyx and the jasper and the saffron and the and the emerald, and the 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 carbuncle and the gold and the workmanship of thine the thy tabrets of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so thou wast upon the holy mount of God. Thou wast wa walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways. From the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. So the devil isn't this ugly person that some cartoons might play him out to be. The devil at one point was the cherub that covereth. So I mean, he's a beautiful creation by the Lord in heaven. And so when we realize what it is, is that we realize what the devil is. The devil isn't this ugly, grimsome person that he might be portrayed to be. He is an angel at one point and a cherub that covereth. I mean, there was, I mean, he was high and lofty. He had, could go to and from. So you can see that, that there's an adversary that is highly credible. And so knowing that what he is, but we realize that we know what his downfall was. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. And once you kind of know what your enemy is, you now know how to kind of better face him. Isaiah 14, look at verse 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which dost weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars, for, of the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou hast brought me down to hell to the sides of the pen. That the devil's number one thing that made him fall was his pride. 
That's the iniquity that came inside of him that we read in Ezekiel 28. It's that pride welled up in him, and he said, I'm going to be like the Most High. So we know that pride is the number one thing we can watch for if the devil's attacking us because pride is not of the Father. So you can kind of see if you're being tempted in that way that it's not him. The devil has devices that he uses. So he, de uh, he devises in Revelation 12 and verse 9, it says, The great dragon was cast out, the old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast down with him. So the devil had a lot of saying. And it's easy. Some people might say, man, I've kind of fallen into a pitfall. Or in life, you can kind of watch where you're like, man, I've just kind of given into some things. Or, man, I was deceived by some things. Um, at one point, 50% of the population was deceived. You know, Eve was deceived, and then Adam disobeyed. But then same thing today, that he which deceiveth the whole world. So the devil is very crafty in what he does. So we have to be on guard. And we have to just kind of be watching for those things. Um, we will get into kind of some how to conquer these things in a little bit. Um, so he deceives people because he's the great deceiver. God's not in it to deceive us, but he's in it to deceive us. It's not that he doesn't want us to follow God. It's just that he doesn't want us to be effective for God. Once you've gotten saved, we, he realizes that you're going to go and be with Jesus in heaven. But if he can get you to not be effective, then he wins. Because the devil already knows at the end of the book that he loses. Now, in his mind, he's convinced himself, I believe, that he's going to win the battle. But Satan said, hey, if I'm going to lose, then I'm going to take as many people with me as I can. And he's doing a really good job. The devil, he tempts us just as he tempted the Lord. Go to Matthew chapter 4. So Jesus is just tempt He just fasted 40 days in the wilderness. And he's, com he's coming in. The devil comes in to tempt him in his weakest moment. The devil's pretty smart with that stuff comes and tempts us at our weakest and most vulnerable moments. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, When the tempter came, that's the devil, came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. So he's tempting the Lord Jesus and saying, Hey, if, if you are God, why don't you go and just show me? I mean, the devil knows the scriptures. He knew that there would be signs coming. So he's like, hey, let's see if I can tempt him. Is being tempted a sin? No, but falling into it is. Or giving into that temptation is a sin. And we ought to just continue to watch those things. In our Christian life, if we don't really get tempted much, we should probably ask the Lord what's wrong with us. And you're like, well, man, that sounds like really weird thing to say. Well, if you're not being tempted by the flesh, the world, and the devil, then you've already given into it. So you've got to watch that. I mean, the temptations come, and that's, it's not a bad thing. A bad thing is giving into it. But when you're tempted, it's like, hey, let's see if I can get a pitfall. That flesh, the world, and the devil might be like, hey, if I can get a temptation, if I can get a hook in there, then I can kind of pull them down. So being tempted isn't a bad thing. I mean, the Lord was tempted three times, but yet without sin. So it's that if the temptations aren't coming and you're just giving in to them, you just ask the Lord, hey, is there something in my life that I'm not doing right? We kind of go from there. The devil, he accuses, and he casts down because of it. If you're like me and you've ever sinned, and all of a sudden you give in to that sin or you give in to that temptation, and the next thing you know, the devil's like, well, man, now you've already messed up. You shouldn't pray. Has anybody else had that happen? Or, man, you've messed up, you've sinned, you probably shouldn't read your Bible for a while. You know, because it's going to show you how horrible a person you are. Anybody else have a Christian life like that? Well, I have that way. Like, if I sin, all of a sudden it's like, oh, man, I have to go to God and pray again to ask for forgiveness for the same sin that I've committed a thousand times. I mean, I know most of you are like, no, I, I just give it to the Lord and walk away. 
But isn't that how it is, though? The flesh and just the devil and demons or whatever. And all of a sudden, they're like, you mess up. And then you're like, ah. Because you just feel humiliated, right? Because you're like, God, why can't I just do better? And the devil's like, hey, you know what? You probably can't do better. Well, that's a lie. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Because he that's in me has already beaten the devil. Kicked him right in the forehead. Genesis 3 says he's going to do that. He's already conquered sin and death for me. I just have to remember it. The devil's going to try to accuse us, try to cast us down. We just have to say, hey, we've already beaten that. We've already gotten the victory. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse 4. The number one thing God tries to do, or the number one thing Satan tries to do, is to pervert God's word. He's done it since the beginning. The first recorded words is him trying to be prideful and then him changing what God said. Genesis 3, look at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You should not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may not eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent saith unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Man, the devil does a really good job of changing the truth into a lie. Because he took a half-truth and made it a lie. And he causes doubt on some things. And we got to watch for those things. Because the devil's in there to try to pervert it. And he's done a really good job with it in churches today. Because two things that are different can't be the same. So you've got to watch those things and search the scriptures. Make sure they're true. Don't just take a word for it. Go and study it out. Why don't I do these things? Well, because God's word says it. Well, why? Where? And we ought to make sure we know these things. Um, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He hinders God's servants. As once we get saved, we know that we ought to serve the Lord with our lives. But the devil definitely tries to get in there and tries to hinder us. You know, it's the same thing when you try to serve the Lord and you get excited and then all of a sudden you come to church and the girls wearing the same dress you are. And you're like, How? Right? It just might hinder your spirit that day. You were excited to wear it, and now they're wearing it, and now it can't be exciting for both of you. I mean, I've never experienced that, but I've heard stories of it. <laughs> Guy comes in, they're wearing the same tie, and they're like, oh, your wife shops at Macy's, right? <laughs> There's no problems about it. I mean, I just, I, you know, you go to Costco for the wintertime, right? And then you show up to church, and everyone has the same coat on? Because everyone bought their winter coat at Costco. And there's only three colors. So you're like, okay, I'm just going to buy all three of them and have them all in the truck so I can just wear a different color that the majority is not wearing. <laughs> but the Lord will do, the, the devil will use anything he can to get you discouraged to serve Jesus. You know what? I gave a really good, heartfelt idea, and the pastoral staff didn't like it. Well, we also got like 500 other ideas. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just the devil will try to use anything like that. To try to get us to be like, you know what, I just don't want to serve Jesus. Or they don't listen to me. Or that other person in my class didn't listen to me. Or they didn't discipline their kid like I would have to discipline my kid. I don't really like the clothing style they wear or whatever. You know, none of that stuff matters in eternity. But I've seen people get, just get, you know, upset about it. Like I've seen people leave church over it. And I'm like... Why? I'd rather focus on the new visitor that's never been to Open Door before, never been to church before. Whether they're dressed the way that I'd like or what, I'm like, I'm glad you're here. Hey, let me show you where to sit. Hey, these are my friends. Hey, this is a friend of mine. What was your name again? <laughs> right, that's how church ought to be, right? It ought to be a family. We're taking everybody in. But the devil kind of gets in there and he likes to hinder that servant because it gets us focusing inward and not outward. I'm glad somebody on December 5th, 1999 was looking outward 
when I came to church. I'm glad they had time for me after Sunday school to share the Rums Road with me. Because I wouldn't have been friends with me back then. I was a little rough. <laughs> Might still be a little rough, but, but I'm glad that somebody said, hey, you know what? It's okay. I'm going to take that long-haired bus cannon and I'm going to kind of show them some stuff. And that's how we ought to focus on it. Because when we start looking at lost souls that need Jesus, the things inside don't really matter that much. It doesn't matter if they have the same dress on or the same tie or the same whatever. It doesn't matter if they accepted all my ideas or anything because people are still getting saved. And that's what we ought to focus on. We ought to focus on inviting our neighbors saying, hey, come to the Christmas concert. There's probably going to be a song that you don't like. But that's okay. Because there might be lost people that come that do like it. And they get saved. And we just kind of focus on the loss that need to be saved. But with it, how do we be equipped? Uh, sorry, how does he hinder us? Is because he's the hinderer. First Thessalonians, or First Thessalonians 2, 17. It says, but we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoring to more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. What is it? That could be anything that hindered you from coming. I look at it this way. If there's like a bunch of trials that happen before like a big event at church or whatever, I'm like, the Lord's going to do something because the devil's working real hard to stop it. I mean, that's how I look at it. And... The biggest one that you ought to do, it's a selfish one, is you ought to pray for your staff. But more so, and this is selfish, then I know it, you ought to pray for your staff's family. Because um, I, I don't know how it is in other pastors' life, but in my life, so the biggest attack, yeah, the, Lord might, the devil might attack us, but more so the devil can attack my wife and my kids. Well, if the devil attacks them and they give in to it, what does that do that hurts me? Most of the time, the devil won't necessarily come directly at us, but he'll go to our families. So I cover your prayers. I know it's very selfish, and I know the other staff does as well. But pray for our families. Pray for my wife and my three kids. And it's very selfish. Why? Because the devil attacks them. He attacks me. And so it's kind of those same things that you kind of... And we ought to pray for each other. I know the staff, we pray for everyone in our ministries. We pray for those that are sick whether we mention them on Thursday night or not, but we go through that list. I know I do every week, praying for everybody, lift them up, lifting you up, those are my ministries, for you and your families. Because I know if the most important things we can pray for one another. God equips us for battle. He doesn't just say to go for it and then not do it. Go to 1 John chapter 4. And look at verse 4. <clears throat> First John verse four. It says, Ye are ye ye are of God, little ones, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you highlight in your Bible, I'd highlight that one, because the devil is is against you, but Jesus is in you and he can win the battle. Um, Ephesians six, you see the the armor of God, you ought to put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, your shoes shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. But the one that most people don't mention is that praying. Pray on the armor of God. And we pray for others. Like I said, pray for your staff. Pray for your friends. Pray for those you serve with. The best thing to do is memorize someone's name is by praying for them. You stop lifting the Lord and the Lord brings their, mem their mind to you. Because we have a battle and we can face it. The Lord gave us the armor to put it on, but he goes into it with us. He goes into every one of your battles with you, every one of your temptations with you, and he's already beaten all of them. He just says, hey, just bring it to me. I can take care of it, and I can battle it. Future victory is certain. Um, as you see the little chart there, that dispensational chart, we're living in the church age, which is also the age of grace where we're at today. So you can kind of see where we're at in the time frame of it. We're kind of at a pause right now, but we know that the last days are upon us. I know it's sooner than it was yesterday. And I pray that it's in my lifetime. Yeah. They're like, well, what if you're wrong? Then I'll be in heaven and he'll still be coming back. 
So I know he's coming back. I pray he's coming back soon. Um, and it's closer than it was yesterday. I'm looking for death of the rapture. So the next one is we will be caught up in the rapture or death. Um, we wait for that day for the Lord to come back and call us up in the rapture, those that are saved. Um, or if we die before that, then we'll be with the Lord. Um, the Bible doesn't have the word rapture in it. So those that are Bible scholars, rapture is not in the Bible, in the King James Bible at all. Um, but it is to be transported with extreme joy. Um, the Bible refers to it as that blessed hope that Paul talks about um, in the Scripture. Uh, in Titus 2.13, it says, Looking for that blessed hope and that a glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When the Lord comes back in the cloud and calls us back with a trump, uh, and we'll be there. The most important part we're going to focus on tonight, we'll be standing at, before the judgment seat of Christ as saved individuals. That's how our works will be judged, based on how our heart is towards them. The Lord blesses our good works out of the abundance of the heart. Just like he loves the joyful giver, he likes those that serve the Lord with a glad heart. I don't believe the Lord rewards those that serve him with a sour heart. Because you're not doing it for him, you're doing it for you. So you want to do it with a joyous heart for the Lord. Um, and we'll know what that is. Um, those that aren't saved will be here and they will go through... Uh, the world during the tribulation period where God is going to have a righteous judge and he's going to unleash that. Um, Christ will return to earth uh, at the second coming. That's when his uh, feet come down and touch the Mount of Olives as he comes through the eastern gate um, and kind of set everything right. And, he'll, and then so Christ will rule over the earth during the millennial reign. <clears throat> I know I'm kind of going through this quickly. I just want to get to the end, but kind of focus that there's an end coming and why we want to do it. And the hardest part of why we do it is unbelievers will be judged at the great white throne judgment. And you have that in Revelation 20. Um, and that great white throne judgment, those that have never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior are going to go to a lake of fire. So at the end, unbelievers will be judged at the great white throne judgment. Um, and then why we should do it. We should live today in light of eternity. We know that eternity is coming. And one day, we will win no one to the Lord. There will come a point in all of our lives, before the rapture or the rapture, that the last soul will get saved. That your witness will be no more. So we've got to live every day as if it's our last day. And realizing that hell is real and death is sure. No one's expecting death, but everyone knows it's coming. There will come a day where you can't witness to your neighbor. There will come a day where you can't witness to that coworker you don't like. There will come a day that you can't witness to that son or daughter that's not saved or parents that are not saved. There will come a day. So we should live with that light of eternity. Why? To share the gospel regularly. Now we're not commanded to win those that are lost because the Lord does the winning, but we're to plant the seeds. We're to share the gospel with them. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the why we do it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone will receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The Lord keeps a record of it. He sees it all. And we ought to live in light of it. You know, have a track or a pen available with you always. <laughs> but what is it you ought to be just ready to be able to share the gospel with people? You're like, well, man, I don't really know the gospel. 
Will you just tell them how you got saved? You don't have to be smart. You just know you're saved. You're like, well, how'd you get saved? Just tell them. I like to pass it a track. Some of them I have. I just say, hey, do you know what? I want to tell you about a friend of mine. And this best friend changed my life. 23 years ago, my life was never the same. Let me tell you about him. It can be as simple as, hey, do you know what? I just want to invite you to our church. Hey, I don't know if you have anything going for Christmas, but we have a Christmas concert this week, and I want to invite you out to it. If I get to talk to them and they go to our church, I'm like, hey, I don't want to steal you from your church, but if you have a free Saturday night, why don't you come listen and get a blessing? Because that's all it takes. I remember I came to church. I was just hanging out at a friend's house. He said, hey, why don't you come and spend the night? I said, sure, why not? Came and spent the night. He's like, oh, yeah, by the way, we go to church tomorrow. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I came and got saved. Amen. You know, it's not a day goes by, I don't thank God for Mike and Josh Brady. Because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have got saved. My sister probably wouldn't have got saved. I can tell you, I wouldn't be in the ministry. And the rest of my family who's now saved probably wouldn't have got saved. Well, what is that? Mike and Josh Brady said, hey, you want to come spend the night at my house? And then, oh, yeah, by the way, we go to church tomorrow. Then he gave me the Romans Road, didn't do nothing. They just hoodwinked me. But it's just as simple as that, right? Charles has burden got saved from a track left on a toilet. One of the greatest preachers of all time. A track left on the back of a toilet. So every little bit makes a difference. What is that? Just living in light of eternity. Where can I share the gospel with people? Because at the end of the day, the Lord will give an account for that judgment and how we get judged accordingly. Remember, we all give an account to how we live our lives, whether it be good or bad. If you're like me, I'd rather have a good account. I'm not saying you need to be a witnessing machine and witness to every single person you see, but you ought to be sensitive to the Spirit and witness to those the Holy Spirit tells you to. And think about those people at this season. Hey, is there somebody that I should probably tell before the end of the year? And kind of make a list. Hey, Lord, can you just give me an opportunity to witness to so-and-so before the end of the year? And the Lord will open up that door. You just have to ask him. So our assignment for next week, we have two verses. I was going to ask you guys to quote them all, but there were six verses last week for memorization. And I was like, those are a lot. So 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. Uh, will be your memorization for next week.